Okay, we'll now call this workshop meeting of Jacksonville City Council to order. Council, you have a copy of the proposed agenda for tonight's meeting before you, and I would entertain a motion at this time to adopt the agenda. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? And that motion carries. And we're going to begin tonight with a joint land use study draft review. And Richard, I'll let you do the introduction. Thank you. We're also pleased this evening to have members of the Planning Advisory Board. This is not a joint session, but we do welcome both of you gentlemen to, to the session this evening. Several years ago, there was a joint session between the City Council and the County Commission. At that time, a request was made of both bodies to consider a new joint land use study. Through the process of consultant selection, Stantec was selected, and over the last 18 months, they have worked very closely with the county staff, the city staff, the public, and the base to produce a document which Ray Greer from Stantec is going to provide an overview for you this evening. This is not the time to ask for adoption. It is the time to have a lot of dialogue. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Ray Greer with Stantec to give you an overview and specifically discuss the items in the plan relative to the city of Jacksonville. Ray. Thank you, Richard. Good afternoon. I'm Ray Greer. I'm the project manager for the, the joint land use study update. And uh, what I'd like to do tonight, we have a draft, and the draft is on the website. The website is camplejunejlus.com. And what we're at in the process is taking public comment for the whole month of June. And uh, what I'd like to do is kind of give you an overview of what this document is, what it contains, and really the overall structure of it, and what it's comprised of, and then talk about a little bit about the recommendations that actually applied to the city of Jacksonville. And before we begin, I'd like to just talk about a little bit about the joint land use process itself. Some people, um, they get the joint land use, especially the public, the joint land use process confused with multiple other things. A lot of people think it's, um, about the insulation trying to expand their boundaries. We hear that a lot as we go around the country and, and conduct joint land use studies. But you know, a joint land use study is actually just like its name. It really is a joint effort between the insulation and the surrounding communities that's around the insulation to really work together to identify any existing or potential future encroachment or compatibility issues, both from a growth stamp standpoint and also from the mission standpoint. standpoint. You have to look at you know, what the mission footprint is and how it impacts the community and then how the community impacts the <coughs> mission's footprint and then work together. Everybody's at the table. We got the insulation and all the communities together. Everybody works together to develop strategies to identify, to, to address any identified items that are occur or may occur in the joint land use study. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight is what we, where we're at, what we've found and some of the items that um, have been identified. And as Richard mentioned, we've been working on this about 18 months. This is a, a Definitely a process. You know, I've enjoyed working with your staff. Your staff's part of this, and uh, it's been a great joint land use study. It's always interesting to come into a different community and learn it, and also see you know how involved the community is here. I mean, you can definitely see the growth occurring, you know, and it has occurred in the past. But what the interesting thing is here is how much the community supports the installation, and it's it's really you know refreshing to see and see how everybody works together. You know how advanced the city of Jacksonville and Onslow County working together and with the installation on re already resolving a lot of items that typically we see in the most joint land use studies. And what I'd like to do is really talk about real quick what the chapters are. We got eight chapters or eight sections in this joint land use report and they're, they kind of build on each other. The first chapter is the introduction and it is just that. It's the introduction to a joint land use report and it's an introduction to Camp Lejeune, kind of overall the joint land use study. It identifies the 2003 study and then the update to it, which is what this is. The next section is the public involvement section. And this public involvement section, section discusses the technical working group, which is made up of your staff members, Richard, Ron, Ryan, all serve on the technical working group, along with Joe from the installation. And then on the policy committee, uh, your mayor sits on the policy committee. And this is the overall arching committees that form the joint land use report and we work together and, and work together to identify the issues and work together to identify the solutions to it. But in addition, we do public outreach. We've done a numerous public surveys. We've collected over 322 surveys from the public where they give their input. We've done a series of public meetings. We've done nine 
public meetings at the conclusion of this week, we had done nine. And we will also go back and then work with the other local governments on adoption. So at the end of the day, public workshops and public hearings will total about 12 to 13 throughout this entire process. And then in addition, as I mentioned, we have a joint land use website that all the information is housed on, the document itself, and all the meetings and all the updates and all the maps, everything is on there. And you can identify it, you can find it, you can download it. And then you can also leave us comments. It has a place in there that you, if you want to identify it, some issues or comments you want to provide back to us, you can provide them on that website and they'll come right back to us. And we are recording those as we're in the public document period. And we'll bring that back to the technical working group and ultimately to the policy committee uh, early July to discuss some of the public input that we've got from the draft report itself. Then the next section is the community profile. And this is where we take all six local governments. And we have uh, city of Jacksonville, we have the town of Swansboro, the town of Holly Ridge, the town of North Top Cell Beach, the town of Richlands, and Onslow County as the six local governments that we're currently working with that, in conjunction with Camp Lejeune, that sit together to make up the technical working group and the policy committee. And over the overview of each community really identifies what how their aspect is and how they play their relationship inside the communities, and then how they, in conjunction with the next chapter, which is the military profile how they fit into that mission, that mission uh, insulation footprint. And what we have identified as a study area is a five mile radius that occurs around the boundary of Camp Lejeune, and that's our study area. And it encompasses almost the entire, actually it does encompass the entire city boundary. City of Jacksonville encompasses all the other cities and a portion of Swansboro, and then um, a portion of, of Onslow County that the joint land use study area is about 200,000 acres. And of course, Camp Lejeune itself is roughly about 150,000 acres. So it's a good size area and makes up you know, all six local governments that is also part of this. And then our next section is the compatibility tools. And this section really takes and analyzes what programs are out there, not only for the installation, but also for the local governments. We analyze existing land development regulations, comprehensive plans, and CAMA plans, and also Anything from the federal and state, what the Department of Agriculture is doing, Onslow County has a tremendous amount of agriculture, and you'll be analyzed the programs they have in place all the way down to what the programs that Camp Lejeune is using from the federal and state programs to um, help continue their mission or to mitigate some of their impacts, whether it's environmental impact or vice versa, the end, um, also mission-related impacts. And federal and you know, that deal with dredging like the Army Corps engineers, which is a viable portion of not only many of the communities here, but also for the insulation that utilize the new river. So all that's contained together in this section and analyzed. And what we do with it, we take in the next chapter is the community development compatibility analysis. And what we do, we take the, the other previous five sections and we kind of analyze everything that's contained in those five sections to actually do a compatibility analysis. And so as part of this compatibility analysis, we identify areas of interest, areas that either are uh, areas of concern or areas that can be strengthened, or it, sometimes it's just additional studies that need to be done to actually further an item that will could benefit either the insulation or the communities. And they're identified in here, and then they're presented back to the technical working group. We presented all 19 items to the technical working group in a workshop. And what came out of it was the recommendations. Now the recommendations contain 62 recommendations that implement those 19 areas of interest. And for instance, the area, an area of interest is uh, policy reinforcement. And the areas of interest I'm gonna discuss, the next eight that we're gonna talk about, actually is the ones that really apply, the high priority that apply back to the city of Jacksonville, the city of Jacksonville is involved in. And in these, we take and rank them. And these items are ranked and they're ranked mainly for implementation purposes are ranked to be able to identify funding sources, which the Department of Defense Office of Economic Adjustment funds the joint land use process. They fund the study and they will also go back and fund the implementation. If it's identified as a recommendation in the joint land use report, they will fund it. And you know, there's certain perspectives of what in certain circumstances and items that have to be addressed in the joint land use study that they will fund. It's mainly land use Additional studies, but also really targeted at encroachment and compatibility items. But in it, we've ranked them 
And the next eight items I'm going to talk about is the higher priority items that apply to the city of Jacksonville. <clears throat> Number one is policy and reinforcement. And this, in the policy and reinforcement, the city of Jacksonville and Onslow County have done a great job of setting up path, uh, the flight path overlay districts. I mean, they have a lot of stuff in place, dark sky. They have so much stuff in place that the other local governments do not. And one of the things that we see is the ability to get consistent regulations throughout the study area. And to do that, what we recommend is to develop a military influence overlay district where this can be identified for the study area, basically that five mile swap as it goes and applies to all six local governments. And then they have consistent standards to be in place there. And what that will allow for is to get the consistent standards in place and also help the smaller local governments get those adopted. And we see that through the implementation portion of this being a major component to implementing this joint land use study. And this is a number one high priority, but it's also a major, uh, it's a major recommendation that will have to be implemented to make the joint land use successful. The next item is waterway access. And naturally, with the New River and the importance of the New River, not only to Camp Lejeune, but also to the, the boating community, to the recreational fishermen, to, and to the commercial fishermen, it's an important water body. And one of the things that we've seen with the water body is the need to be able to coordinate with Camp Lejeune and the users of it. And one of the things that we're recommending is to continue moving forward and the city helping work with Camp Lejeune and Onslow County on doing studies to identify who the users are of the river and to be able to take that study and develop some strategies of how do you actually better educate the boaters, to educate the community on what goes on on the river, how the river is being used, and then also will provide more information to Camp Lejeune so they can learn of the users, the commercial fishermen, the recreational fishermen, how they use the river. So we see this as being a, another very important item for the Joint Land Use Report. And then the next one is vertical obstruction. The vertical obstruction really deals with um, the height issues with cell towers, wind turbines, which is not an issue for the city, that's more of an issue for the county, but having consistent standards again. What we want to see, and the city of Jacksonville has height limits and they also have uh, processes in place for cell towers. And what we want to see is that to be uniform throughout the other six, the other five local governments. And so we have uniform, consistent standards throughout that military influence overlay district to provide those regulations again to be consistent throughout that study area. The next is transportation. And you know, I don't think I've ever done a joint land use study that we, transportation wasn't one of the items. And here, transportation is not typically, in the most joint land use studies, transportation is always a major issue. You get a military installation, you always have transportation issues. However, the city of Jacksonville and Oslo County, this region has done so much in the past to address a lot of the transportation issues that occur around the installation. And some of the new items that we have seen from the previous study that didn't occur in the 2003 study is really the, the Sneets Ferry area. And that's where we're seeing transportation, more transportation related impacts is down in that area. And you know, it's, it's, it's combined with the growth that's occurring down there and also with um, the growth of the military down there with the MORSOC. And you know, there's a lot, DOT is already working, the MPO is already involved. I mean, they've got plans in place. And so our recommendation here is to continue for the city to continue working to identify better transit. You know, is there opportunities to have more transit down there, conserve the Morsock area, and you know, have assist the MPO in doing that and DOT also in doing the studies and then finding solutions to that. And the next is implementation. As I mentioned, the implementation for this document to be a success is the only way to make it happen. You got to implement this document, put those regulations in place, and do the studies, do the policies, get them there, or this document will just do nothing but sit on the shelf. And we unfortunately have seen a lot of joint land use studies in the past that have done that. The people in local governments never implement them, they never went past the study stage. And one of the things that we do and recommend is to set up an implementation committee. And basically it would be the policy committee and the technical working group committee transitioning to the implementation committee. You keep all the local governments together and you keep that momentum that has occurred throughout that 18 months that it took to develop this document and you move that forward. And we see that being a major help in moving the, the joint land use process forward through implementation. And then the next item 
is the um, unmanned aircraft systems. And this is the drones. And you know, one of the things that we, we have started to see this in the last couple of years being a major issue around the military installations, and it's become a major issue for communities too. Drones are a great tool. And you know, a lot of people use them, but they, are, they occur from the Walmart drone all the way to the commercial drones. And the military installations have a lot of uh, issues with them, both in the, around the installation and in their airspace. And one of the things that um, we have recommended is to be able to um, have policies put in place for the local governments on how to address the drones. And with the city of Jacksonville given its location in the um, near New River, you know, the flight paths going through the city. This is, you know, a perfect area that um, you do have to um, regulate and educate. And, you know, one of the things with the, the drone users is really providing that education on where they can fly, how they can fly them, how high they can fly them. And, you know, it's really getting that education in place is a major component to this recommendation. And the next item is a water supply. And this, the water supply issue actually is targeted directly to the city of Jacksonville and Camp Lejeune. You know, both have their water sources very close to each other. The portable water wells are near each other and continue to work. There's been an aquifer drawdown study that was um, done and conducted. We want to see that implemented and carry forth, you know, is there additional studies that need to be done to analyze the water sources and continue to work together with Camp Lejeune and with the city on the uh, water sources? Not only identify stuff that can be done today, but also put strategies in place that can be uh, done 10 and 15 years from now. And then the next item is airspace management. And this is the last of the eight major items that we've identified as recommendations. And the airspace management, as I mentioned, with the airspace, as you can see on the map at the, the very top, you have um, Albert J. Ellis Airport that sits up to the north, and then you have Camp Lejeune's airspace, including the New River airspace, that they overlap each other. And you know, of course, you have the flight path corridors that come through the city for both the training areas that go in and out of the ranges, and then also for the uh, New River Air Station, where they fly in and out of. And with the airspace, you know, again, you know, one of the largest components that we want to see accomplish through this is to work together and have consistent standards to manage that airspace. Now the city of Jacksonville doesn't fall in there with a lot of the recommendations. One of the big recommendations out of this applies actually to Onslow County and it's with Albert J. Ellis to have a uh, overlay district conducted for the airport. And how it applies to the city of Jacksonville is mainly with the BASH standards, the bird airstrike hazard standards and getting those in place in that military influence overlay district so you can help reduce in the future through compatible development and um, reduce bird airstrikes in the future for both Albert J. Ellis Airport and for the New River Air Station. And with that, I'll talk about the schedule for a couple minutes. As I mentioned, the technical work group, the policy committee have worked on the draft. They've spent a couple months on the draft, provided all their comments, we included them into this draft. We've taken the draft, we put it out for public review for the month of June. Again, it's posted on our website, it's Camp Lejeune, JLUS.com, and we're taking comments for that. We're also doing uh, workshops. We did a workshop with the um, Onslow County Planning Commission last, or the week before last, and uh, we're also doing a workshop down in uh, State Spirit to, again, discuss the draft, take public comment, let the public know it's out there. And um, what we want to do is, by the, by the month of July, by the end of this month, is take all the public comments, get them back to the technical working group, let the technical working group review them, we'll make adjustments to the, to the joint land use report, and then bring it back as a final document in July. And then what we'd like to do, once it's approved by the technical working group and the policy committee, is then begin working it forward to be accepted by the local governments. And what we're targeting is that towards the end of July and August, to be able to let the local governments review it and accept it through a resolution. And with that, I'll answer any questions you might have. Give me that website again. It's Camp Lejeune, J-L-U-S dot com. Let me make a couple of comments. Um, Ray and the Stantec uh, staff came very highly recommended from the work that they've done in a number of other areas. The important thing in doing a joint land use study is to make sure that you put recommendations in here that can in fact be implemented. I can tell you from the work that Ron and Ryan and, and others and I have done, 
We do not find in any of the recommendations anything that I believe you're going to find will be onerous. One of the things that I think you should be proud of is that over the years with the new UDO, with the actions you took before the UDO was adopted, such as the flight path overlay with height restrictions, with regulations on telecommunication towers, the vast majority of things that could negatively impact the training mission of the base from a city standpoint, uh, they have been covered. So we're not, you're not looking at a document that you should say, what kind of political unrest are you going to have? This is really about fine tuning a lot of the things and standardizing. Ray mentioned early on the dark sky standard. Well, when Ryan worked with you on the UDO and worked with the Planning Advisory Board, you remember all of the work that we put in relative to ensuring that there wasn't any type of light bleed over that could impact neighbors, but also impact the base. So many of the things that you will find in here are to standardize those reports. What doesn't <coughs> help the base at all is if you have a height limit of whatever, let's say 100 feet on something in the city, but in the county, it's 150 feet, and the Sneeds Ferry is 200 feet. That type of inconsistent, inconsistency creates difficulties for managing the flight patterns and the missions of the base. You'll also find in here a number of recommendations that really will allow us to possibly apply for grants. For example, while the city wouldn't be the agent applying for the grant, we know that the shoaling and the need for dredging the pass, if it's not done on a regular basis, it impacts not only commercial fishing and recreation fishing, but it also impacts the training mission of the base. By putting those type things in the report, you then become eligible to apply for federal money. But if you don't put those things in the report, they become difficult. Now, let me give you one example that was brought to my attention uh, by one of Ray's colleagues, and I'm going to read to you an email, if I can get to page one. As you know, over the last several years, we've had a number of programs that allow us as a city to provide the base with certain services. You know, Anthony and the transportation group have worked on managing all of the traffic signals and so forth. Here is a pilot project that is just coming out of the federal government. It is called the Defense Community Infrastructure Pilot Program. The key word is infrastructure. Infrastructure is defined very broadly. It could be fiber optics. It could be water. It could be sewer. It could be roads. It's infrastructure. What we're recommending, not necessarily for you tonight, but something that I'll be sending to Ray, is something that would allow us to put in the document clear language about using the Defense Community Infrastructure Pilot Project to look at those types of infrastructure compatibility, but also cooperation type projects. Those might have to do, as you know, one of the projects in your capital improvement program is to determine how we could possibly better utilize the 15 million gallon wastewater treatment plant down at the base. Well, through this, there, are study money, there is study money available that could actually, instead of the city having to spend the money to figure out all those options, that we could possibly get a grant for. Likewise, even if we have done a study, uh, this program could possibly give you money to implement some of those things rather than going to your ratepayers. So again, uh, from a staff standpoint, management standpoint, I certainly commend Ray for the excellent work and the communications that we've had. Ben Warren out of the county has been, uh, also he should be commended for the leadership and Joe has done an outstanding job uh, with, the, uh, with the base and making sure we cooperate there. Uh, Ron, you and Ryan have had a lot of input on this. Comments that uh, you want to make? Well, I, one thing I'd like to reinforce, some of the comments that Ray made, like our, our <clears throat> policy committee, you know, is basically the cooperative planning group which you know, we already had in existence, and rather than creating something separate for the JLUs, you know, use the Cooperative Planning Group. And this comment about the Implementation Committee, we're just gonna put a different hat on the CPG and allow them to help direct the efforts of implementation. 
So, I mean, I think that some of the structure that Ray mentioned that he's seen in our community that we already have in place and a way to manage some of these projects that we have to manage. Definitely. I mean, just, it, it's interesting the timing that, you know, Ray's presentation tonight's kind of a, a look ahead to uh, you, well, your next item where we're gonna talk about some uh, tweaks to the lighting standards, which will further, you know, echo the recommendations of the policy here within JLU. So the timing was pretty good there. So, you know, look forward to making sure that our ordinances continue to protect the missions of the military base and in the community. Ryan's been implementing the implementation plan before we can ever get it finished. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, comments? Uh, the, the base has been very happy with the fun process and how involved uh, all the communities have been. Very happy with the process and Stantec has taken to analyze and research. Uh, we're looking forward to the implementation process and will fully participate. I do have one question though, and that is how, how would you go about obtaining the uh, town's uh, uh, concurrence and approval? We do the same thing. We will work with them on setting the uh, meetings up, the public hearings up, to bring this document to them, and we'll present it to them. Are we seeking individual town signatures, or yeah, okay. uh, acceptance by resolution? Okay. And so, in August, uh, if the plan stays on schedule, in August, the matter will be before the mayor and council as a resolution for us to adopt. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay. Now that does not. That does not require you to implement. What it does is you agree to work towards the implementation. But let's say for discussion purposes, there's something as we go through the implementation that the staff has brought you things. Uh, the plan does not say you need to do A, B, C. It says conceptually you need to address this area. How you address a specific item is left to you as a policy statement. And that's correct. Now, the other thing that I would remind council, uh, there is a local match. The, the study was actually funded through OEO, o -E -O, OEA, OEA, all those federal initials, yeah. <laughs> uh, OEA. There is a local match. Our local match is based upon time, it's not cash. So every time that any of us, whether it's John or Carmen or any of us, just like this evening, we will record the hours that we have spent on this document through meetings and so forth, and that generates the local match. But uh, again, that's where we are. At this time, council, questions that you may have about the process. I know you haven't read, had the opportunity to read every page of the book. Any questions? I was wondering, when was the last joint loom, last was, study done? 2003. What was, did you notice any big contrast differences from well, then to now was yeah the the growth patterns have definitely shifted from 2003 um and the, the mission has changed a little bit like with Morsock, with the growth that's occurred down the snates ferry mm -hmm. but also the county didn't have zoning in 2003 the county now has zoning has implemented zoning has over a flight path that really districts in place they have a lot more done than what originally occurred in 2003. yeah i would i would tell you that uh, i I'm glad that I was not involved in 2003 because I could imagine taking a county that doesn't have zoning and converting it to zoning. Many of you lived through some interesting hearings, but because the, the county has implemented so many of the things, and I want to stress, the study is only as good as the implementation. If you adopt a study and we don't implement these things and we don't standardize the way that we approach development, the study will not have been worth the effort. Uh, the other thing that Ray uh, touched on, but I want to uh, especially talk about, uh, Onwasa also was an active partner in this. When you look at all the water resource issues, and obviously the important role that Jeff and the Onwasa staff play in this, they have a role in implementing this, and they have a section in this book. Other questions? I was going to ask that between 2003 and now, was it 16 years? Is it every 16 years that this land study is done, or is it frequently? No, they're typically 10 to 15 years. Okay. Or if you have, um, and you know, of course, within 10 to 15 years, you'll have a, a shift in the community typically that will make a joint land use that need to be updated. Mm -hmm. And typically it's about 10 to 15 year lifespan. 
On the other hand, let's say that the, that the base mission significantly changes. Uh, there is nothing in the law that actually says every 10 years. Uh, it, for a community like ours, 10 to 15 years. But let's say for discussion purposes that the footprint of the military, and I don't mean necessarily acreage-wise, but the overall mission of this military base substantially changed. Let's say it does three years from now. There's nothing wrong with us coming back and using that because instead of doing what we know that the base currently does, they now have a new mission to accomplish. You might update your next joint land you study long before 10 years. But do, doesn't this keep us, by keeping this current, keep us in good step as far as any BRAC studies yes, that are done? it does. And you know, one of the things that the BRAC committee looks at, they'll look at how a community works with insulation. And how have they addressed compatibility? Does the insulation have major compatibility encroachment issues that's going to affect their emission long term? They definitely have something they look at. Yeah, I think another thing that was different as we got started on this one is the studies that the base did, or the range study and the uh, <clears throat> the ACU study, which updated you know current flight pattern, current locations of ranges and the, the noise contours and things like that. So that was brought into this effort That's to great. then look at the land uses to make sure that, you know, we, we're not conflicting with those kind of activities. So again, that, and this is something the base updated since 2003. So that's a reason to again, look at your compatibility. Yeah, we're asked every year, we the base, uh, we get a query from DOD the Office of Economic Adjustment, OEA, whether or not we're interested in, in updating our, our joint land use study comes every year. And really what they're looking for and what we analyze is if we have, have had any mission changes, not necessarily an operational mission, that remains pretty intact, but whether or not we're getting a new weapon system, a, a, a training requirement that extends noise beyond the base that we're used to, uh, and that hasn't happened for some time, so that's why we haven't requested an additional joint land use study. In this particular case, the one we're doing now, we did because we knew that there were some growth patterns that were taking place that we want to take a real good look at. <coughs> one last comment. Uh, it's also interesting, the Havelock component of our Marine Corps here, their study was also done by Stantec. And that was as we reviewed the various uh, responses to the RFP or RFQ, uh, that was one of the things that influenced us to select Stantec was that they had done the Havelock Cherry Point uh, joint, uh, joint land use study. My last comment, this is the joint land use study as you tried to uh, uh, get your pointer, is not all about the military. That's right. It's all about a community of the military and local governments. And, and a good example is during the 2002-2003 study, part of the findings of the joint land use study was that our training at Courthouse Bay with uh, demolitions was really rocking the poor residents of Sneeds Ferry to the point that we conducted some additional deep analysis of, of noise and, and what it was doing to that community. And upon completion of that study, we realized that uh, based on a joint land use study recommendation at that time, that we needed to move that trading away from that particular community. And we did. We moved it to a more centralized portion of the base and got a many thank yous from the state's very <laughs> residents. But that's an example of this is looked at in both ways. When we're looking at it, we're not looking from purely as perspective what the community can do for us but in, in, in reverse to say, and we really do believe that. That's a good point. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Informative, I can't wait to get on and read. <laughs> Page, uh, chapter to chapter. Let us know if you have any questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Next thing we'd like to talk with you about are modifications of some uh, lighting standards. Uh, normally, when we bring to you standards, uh, things are getting more restrictive. 
In this case, actually, we're recommending some modifications that will uh, be more uniform with some of the uh, standard industrial processes of Duke Power and Jones Onslow. Please. Our good evening, Mayor Council. As Dr. Woodruff stated, uh, for the most part, I think you'll see that this is a relaxation of standards, but it's not going to go against the JLU's recommendations. Um, but it's pertaining to the exterior lighting. We we adopted in 2014 the Unified Development Ordinance, which created the City of Jacksonville's initial lighting standards. And we've applied those standards <laughs> since that time. And we've we've noticed, you know, this is kind of our summary slide of, of why we're looking at a proposed text amendment. We did the same thing with the contractor's office a few months back. But uh, a lot of the existing site lighting has... Um, they want to retrofit to the LED, the LED bulbs, and they're, they've discovered that it's kind of difficult to meet our standards. So that was kind of what brought forth this issue, hey, we need to anal make an analysis here and bring a proposed change to you. So we evaluated the existing ordinance and the impacts the change would create, and we believe that what we're going to propose to uh, the Planning Board and City Council in the next couple of months meets the current and proposed j -Loose recommendations but it would be a relaxation of those standards. We discussed these proposals with both Duke Energy and Jones Onslow. We wanted their input to make sure that we were not gonna create any hardships with um, them and what the service they're trying to provide to their customers. And we decided that we would propose an amendment. We met with the planning board last month and went over the same presentation that we're gonna have with you tonight. And our plan is to bring back an actual ordinance amendment uh, to planning board in July and then to city council uh, to welcome you back from your your month off after your budget session <laughs> vacation and uh, i'm not going to read everything here word for word but um, we're proposing some language for existing developments and currently the ordinance doesn't uh, provide any information this is going to give us some codified information that allows staff to look at replacement retrofits and allow them to um, Basically, we'll require that they meet the standards to the maximum extent practicable. And I think one of the main things that we see here is you have lighting fixtures that are on the property line. There's no way that an, a light fixture that's on a property line is gonna meet the maximum light illumination levels of the property line. So this will give us additional flexibility that we don't currently have in the ordinance. It'll allow us to work with you know, the, the site, the site plan, you know, with an existing site to make them meet the standards to the most extent practical. So there's been multiple sites that have come in and say, we want to change out and we've looked at it and said, well, you can't meet the standards of 2.5. So this will help us deal with that scenario. Uh, we're going to expand upon exemptions. I don't know that we necessarily have to, but I found this in some model ordinances. For example, we don't have any airports or runways here in Jacksonville, but it doesn't hurt to have something in case somebody were to come in and propose uh, an airport. Jacksonville used to have one or two. I know there was one on Pine Green Road and one right there near Moosehaven at one point. So uh, I don't know that we're going to have any of those, but just in case we do, um, they would be exempt from the lighting standards to make sure that they meet the FAA in order the base standards. Uh, for example, uh, we work closely with, with base representatives with the cellular phone towers to make sure that they've got the lighting that uh, that they desire to have on there for, for the military mission. Um, we already have some standards for exemptions for holiday light displays. So we're gonna refer people that may look in the lighting standards to the signage article, uh, which is 512. Uh, street lighting would be exempt from our standards. So um, once again, with it being close to right away property lines it's kind of hard to meet the lighting standards with with the cutoff it, it's just impractical so uh, that would be exempt but well, let's make sure you understand these are exemptions from certain standards but for example the lighting standard is not a full exemption from height and from dark skies and all that it's just primarily location that he's talking about right so um, one other uh, exemption, and uh, we'll talk about that one here in a moment too, is the American flag, but uh, the official government flags. You know, there's, there's lights that are, you know, that shine the flags at nighttime, and that would be an exemption. Uh, the next one, I, I would venture to believe that, uh, I mean, the project that's going on right now, although I haven't been out at night, but I've seen uh, the, the fruits of the labor from 
the last two nights on Gumbranch Road where they've already started doing the patches, it, it already rides a lot better. <laughs> in my experience, <laughs> driving home yesterday, you can see they've got all kinds of lighting that were staged there in the Kmart parking lot. That would be exempt from having to meet these standards. I think it kind of goes without saying, but we're going to codify it that way. There's no questions. Uh, same thing where, um, you know, if there's a major fire and, and our fire department has to have these lights that are set up, you know, they're exempt from, from these lighting standards. Um, so some additional prohibited lighting, and some of these are already found in some other locations, uh, but you may remember, um, there used to be a video store here in town that um, you could see the lights shining up in the air at night or sometimes during promotional. You've got these high intense spotlights that they light up the sky and the clouds and, and that would be a prohibited light. You wouldn't be able to set that up because we're worried about the night mission. We don't want that to interfere with, with our pilots that are flying in the evenings. Uh, same thing with the flashing, revolving or intermittent exterior lighting that would be visible from any property line. So those would be prohibited lighting standards. That's proposed, that's not currently in the exterior lighting <coughs> standards of the ordinance. Uh, this is one that, that most closely resembles following the JLUS requirements. Uh, the industry standard is the bug rating, the backlight, uplight, and glare. And we already have a dark sky standard. We're just gonna change the way that that is to a U rating of zero. You can buy different light fixtures and they actually come now with you know, a, a, a rating. And we will be able to see, okay, well, what's the rating of that fixture? Well, it's a 20. Well, that's not gonna work. It's gotta be a U rating. So it's- um, There's there's three, yeah, the U is the uplight. Right. They gotta be rated zero for uplight. Now there's gonna be one exception to that. Um, and that is architectural lighting. We've already allowed that. Basically the lights don't need to go past the, the parapet of the roof, basically. So you can illuminate your building, just don't take it straight up and past the building wall. Uh, the US flag, which, you know, there's no, <laughs> that we look for, um, you know, specific language and, and I'll read what, what we found here in a moment on the US flag. Um, and then decorative post top lights. That was actually a suggestion that Duke Energy made with for like downtown that if, if you don't allow the up rate, the up lighting <coughs> within that with a maximum wattage, kind of lose some lighting on the building. So we, we decided to allow that as an exemption for the decorative post top lights. Um, the, the other two changes, this is one of those to where I don't think it really makes a whole lot of difference. This is just more to help uh, the, the standard of Duke Energy and Jones Onslow. We're proposing to change the 16 foot height max in the residential, the downtown residential, the downtown business districts to 18 feet, and then change the uh, all other districts from 25, the current ma maximum to 30. And the reason why on that again is a lot of these po a lot of these lights are rented just like we rent, you know, lights. The neither of their uh, schedules have a 16 foot pole on them. They have an 18 foot pole. Same thing with 25 and 30. <coughs> and, and what that would mean if we don't make this adjustment is that you have, and I'll use a real life example, although it's further in the past, the, the Dollar General had, was required to have 14 foot maximum lights at the time and their service provider did not have that. What did that mean? They actually had to buy their own lights and install them. So. They own their lights. They couldn't rent them from the, the, the energy provider, which means they have to maintain the lights themselves. So there's some benefit there, and that's why we're proposing those changes. This gives our customers more, more flexibility and, and latitude, and it helps the energy companies. Uh, one of the other things that, um, that we're talking about is uh, if you own two pieces of property or you lease two pieces of property and there's physically a property line between them, the current ordinance says you have to have a maximum lighting there of 2.5. We're creating a provision that says if you own two pieces of property or you lease two pieces, that that requirement of a maximum of 2.5 there at your joint property line, you don't have to meet that standard. You can have 
10.0 there if you'd like. It just would require some hardship in the lighting because you lease or you own two pieces, you may want to sell that later on. Then we deal with the issue then in, in the future. Uh, the other thing is the, the current ordinance says you have to have a minimum standard of 0.2. We're just proposing to eliminate any minimum standard. I mean, if they don't want to have lights on at night, then you know, that's kind of their prerogative. Uh, the other, um, within the, there's an exemption for a security plan. In terms of the organizational structure, we've been kind of doing this piecemeal as we've made uh, amendments. We're replacing the development services director with the city manager or his or her designee. And that way, uh, the manager can appoint whoever, whatever structure is in place at the time on who kind of makes those decisions. So one of the areas that um, basically this is kind of, it's getting better, but it kind of codifies it, is that when do you have to bring your exterior lighting into compliance? Well, when you, when you basically go to renovate your site or you tear down and rebuild or you expand. So right now we're already doing this with um, your parking, your signage, your landscaping and buffering. We're going to propose to bring in the lighting. So if you are remodeling the building and the cost of the building permit portion is more than 25% of the fair market or assessed value, then you would have to bring the exterior lighting into standards. Right now it could be 5% and you would have to comply because there's no provision. This would actually put in a provision that says here's when you upgrade versus you have to upgrade all the time. <coughs> Same thing with the additions and expansions. So anytime you expand or renovate, <coughs> when do you have to do the outside stuff? It kind of groups all that together. And that is a cumulative amount within a five-year time period. And that's all that we have tonight and be happy to answer any questions that you may have, take any suggestions. And um, like I said, we'll, we'll take that and, and bring that back to planning board in the, in the form of an ordinance amendment and then the city council. Um, <coughs> Um, our planning advisory board member, uh, our chairman, who we're is with us tonight. We did present this in a workshop session for them last month, and I think that it was received well. And uh, in this particular case, like I said, it's it's really relaxing the standards more so than making them more strict. Council, any questions of Ron? I just saw one, I can't remember the slide, but you said that it was re referenced as high intensity lighting. and I, I was wondering if there was a, it's pretty far back, but it was, how do you define high, medium, low? Is that standardized by anything or is it? Right, 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 right. High intensity light. Yeah, high, yeah, high intensity light. Beams. So <coughs> to me, I don't, I don't want to use the, the specific um, business, but you could rent these trailers and they literally had like these Hollywood hood lights oh, okay. that I mean, if I can see them from Northwoods and it's over on Pine and Green Road, that's probably a high intensity light. <laughs> but I mean, that may be something to where we need to kind of I mean, define just, that. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, it, it very well could be subjective that you right. know, if it's right. visible like that, I would say that it is. But I mean, we can certainly look at that. Well, what you may decide to do is just uh, work with John on the language. What we're really saying is that uh, searchlights, lasers, and strobe lights, we simply don't want because mm -hmm. of the impact. So we'll work on uh, clarifying the language with the city attorney if that's acceptable. Yes, Other questions? Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, man. Thank you, Council, very much. Lily, if you could come up, we'd like to talk a minute uh, about a study that we're proposing to work in the uh, country Club Villas, which most of us know as Myrtle Woods. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Good evening. As Dr. Woodard mentioned, we're here tonight to talk about a consultant study for the Country Club Villas area. And just as a matter of background, this is a neighborhood that we've worked in for many, many years. I know I first um, came to work in it in 2008. But it's a townhome development that was constructed about 39, 40 years ago um, over off of Country Club and Western Boulevard. There's 126 individual townhome units. 
Um, based on a door-to-door -door survey in December of 2018, we discovered 42, unit, 42 of those were actually vacant, vacant at that time. And based on our experience and interaction over the years, that neighborhood is in various stages of decline. And we also did an income survey and determined that that area was eligible for a HUD designation as a neighborhood revitalization strategy area, which gives us some additional tools to go in there and try to preserve it. This is just a um, map, so you can clearly see where the area here is the um, coastal Carolina to the north. The mall is actually across the street and sits in between the mall, the mall McDonald's off of Western Boulevard, it's that, that intersection there. What we've noticed as a staff is that over the last decade, um, quality of life has gone down. Property maintenance is very much lacking, very high area for our code enforcement team. Property values are extremely low. Um, home ownership rates are low. I think at one point we had six actual, six to less than 10 homeowners actually owning their homes, living in the neighborhood, and that the economic mobility um, is down. And then we also know that we have high safety and health concerns. It's a very high area of interest for our police and fire department. We've met with them. They were really the catalyst for some of our more recent efforts in the area. We have some minimum housing uh, concerns and of course public nuisance with our high grass and weeds and debris and illegal dumping that takes place in the area. And over the years, we've tried various um, efforts to revitalize, revitalize it through the police department. We had a Weed to Seed program about 10 years ago various police interventions and strategies. Most recently, um, it's a front porch site where they actually have their, um, their um, roll, call. roll calls in the neighborhood. So all units basically are present in the neighborhood to give that visual presence that someone's there. Of course, community development has gone in and done um, rehab programs in the neighborhood. We've offered rental, re rental rehabilitation over the years. Code enforcement is in there every week. Sanitation, I believe, is in there twice a week with pickups. And we've even um, called in our streets division to do some even more extensive cleanups in the ditches and um, drainage areas in the neighborhood. And then, of course, we've had volunteer projects and service projects and Marines and youth and staff doing neighborhood cleanups over the, over the years. And more recently, we've really engaged the neighborhood. Um, we've had neighborhood meetings with property owners, the landlords, the tenants, the absentee property owners, um, Coastal Carol Carolina staff, Dr. Heatherly has been present, and we've even gone so far as to acquire three properties to try to gain control of what's taking place. This is just an example of some neighborhood cleanups we did back in October. Um, we did this, of course, there's one blurry picture of someone you might be able to figure out who that is. And uh, this was a more recent project just this year with our Project 365 with the police department. This is 446 Myrtlewood, which we acquired. And we went in and actually gutted and took all of this um, trash and debris out. It's one of our Friday afternoon one city team efforts. We're very proud of coming together to work. This is all the stuff we hauled out. And this was on a Friday afternoon and Saturday morning it was spotless. Our sanitation crews had gotten out there and cleaned that up. And we also purchased the one next door, which is 446 um, Myrtlewood. And just last week, we closed on 427 Myrtlewood. This one had been um, severely damaged by fire, had gone through floor foreclosure, and the owner has abandoned it. And actually, the bank actually gave it back to the owner. It was just that bad. <laughs> never seen, never seen that happen. <laughs> Denied ownership for a long time. We finally figured it out. Well, the bank gave it back. Okay. Um, so what we found is that we have an opportunity through the UNC School of Government to engage them through their development finance initiative to come in and help us put some new eyes and some new ideas on this area, figure out some new strategies. They are specialists in attracting private investment in the neighborhoods like this. They've done it in 130, 134 projects across the state of North Carolina. This is an eligible CDBG area, something that we can actually fund. The uh, consulting fee is 25.2. That is a discounted rate for us as a partner uh, for them. And we were, um, part of their proposal is to work with us to identify the public interest. What is it that we really want to see in that neighborhood? Engage the stakeholders, all of those um, folks that we've met with before and even others. We've even asked them to meet not only with 
the landlords and tenants and property owners, but also with the planning board, our community engagement advisory committee, our environmental appearance committee. All of us have an interest in seeing our neighborhoods preserved. Um, they would also do some market research, help us to figure out what the demand is for an area like that, some high level site analysis, some uh, infrastructure analysis, topography analysis, all of those things we need information on. Finally, a fin financial feasibility. What is it actually gonna take to do and is it worth doing it? And then they'd come back with a set of recommendations that they would prioritize, that they would then leave with us as a deliverable for how we might choose to go forth with um, implementing. Of course, their goals is to identify sites that present catalytic re redevelopment opportunities. And I pause right there because I mentioned we purchased three properties. This will help us be more uh, strategic with what we purpose and what our planned reuses are. We had initially planned to um, We've had three ideas, for example, demolish and um, put in a park, which is one of the things some of the residents have asked for, renovate and put on the market for resale as home ownership, or turn it into revitalize it, re, re, um, remodel, rehab, and turn it into community space. We might bring in programs and after school programs and mentor programs. So we, we're not demolishing now until we figure out what the best use is of the three buildings. With the exception, we may go ahead and demolish the burp. And then they would um, prepare a neighborhood revitalization strategy recommendation, which we can then use to submit to HUD to get the actual official uh, designation. So what we are asking tonight on your uh, agenda, at 7 o'clock, there's a consent item where we'd ask you to authorize uh, Dr. Woodruff to enter into an agreement. Once that agreement is executed, they anticipate a six-month process. They'll come down, have some site visits, and work with staff, review the data, and do all their analysis, and then present some deliverables to us in about in six months. Then we can uh, work from there. So that's one of the difficulties that we have in this particular area is there is no homeowner association, and we also have a tremendous number of owners. There is one uh, owner that has really been positive in what he's been doing with his rental units. He owns 25 of them. But the vast majority of the ownership <coughs> is one, one unit. When you have that many owners with no HOA and no legal requirement to work together, then you have a community that's difficult to move forward. Uh, the grass does not get mowed on a regular basis. You have driven through Myrtle Woods. You know that the typical ownership is whatever, 30 feet wide. The backyards at one time and still today, they have a fenced in area. You can't get to the backyards because of vegetation. So, you know, we have tried through the police department, community development, all of the city employees who have volunteered, the various uh, advisory committees that Lily mentioned. You know, we go in there and do everything we can, and two months, uh, two years later, it's right back to where it was. If we're going to turn Myrtle Woods and, and Country Club Villas, as it's correctly called, if we're going to turn it around, we have to find a different strategy, and that strategy has to be an investment strategy. So uh, from a management standpoint, we recommend that you authorize this. It does not, uh, it will not expend any general fund tax money. It will be funded completely by community development. And our goal is to find a long-term solution that will make Myrtle Woods uh, what we think it should be. And that's home ownership, a quality place for people to live. Questions that you may have? Uh, the chief is here if you want to ask questions about his experiences there. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Okay. Mayor and Council, if you'd like, let's take about a 10 minute break and we'll come back to the last two items. Okay.
Okay, we're back in session. Dr. Whitmer. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Several years ago, uh, we began to look at the need for the city to acquire a drone. And in the FY19 budget, you authorized $10,000 for us to secure a drone. At that time, we agreed that we would report back to Council on the policy on how it would be used. And this evening, what we'd like to do is give you an overview. Uh, it is not a requirement for you to adopt these. These are administrative policies. But at the same time, because the public is always interested in how the drones are used in a community, we feel it's important for you to see the safeguards that we are putting into this uh, administrative policy. Note a large body of law on use of devices. Practically every level of government has come out with regulations on drones. As was mentioned earlier by Ray Greer when we were talking about the joint land use study, drones used to be a toy. They are now a way of doing business. Uh, a moment ago, one of our council members mentioned that uh, having meals delivered by drones. <laughs> well, we've heard of UPS talking about uh, delivering packages by drones and FedEx and so forth. But while we have uh, the FAA and the state of North Carolina laws, this is about the city policies on how the city is going to use a drone. The policies I'm going to be reviewing with you tonight are not about private citizens. So, for example, if Mr. Thomas decides that he would like to buy a drone and find a way for a drone to mow grass, that's between him and the state and the FAA. But on the other hand, if a city employee is going to be using a drone, we believe it's essential for us to have very clear guidelines on how that's going to occur, and that's what we'd like to give you a quick overview, for, uh, overview of. The policy actually rests in the hands of the manager and the city attorney. The concept is that every flight that will occur will have to be approved by the manager and the city attorney or our designee unless there is an emergency mission. For example, if there is a major traffic accident and Mike, as the public safety director, feels that in order to correctly document the fatalities or the major accident, he doesn't have to contact John or me to go through that. As the public safety director, he has the authority to use his judgment. For example, if there's a missing person, let's say a person with Alzheimer's wanders away in the middle of the night from their house, Mike simply makes the decision and then at a later date he reports back to the city manager on each mission. The reason why this is important is we want to make sure that the public is comfortable that there are safeguards and checks and balances. We don't want the public to ever think, well, this person is out there with the city drone and he decided he was just gonna look in my backyard. No, every mission, we want to have checks and balances so that we can tell you as the elected officials that we are safeguarding the privacy of individuals and we are using it within the guidelines of an established policy. While we call them drones, we're actually going to be using the term UAS coordinator. That's the unmanned aerial system. For a while, we called it, we called it UAVs, the unmanned aerial vehicle. But it's now more about regulating the whole system, not just the flying apparatus. The operator must have valid certifications. So for example, if I want to fly the drone, I can't do it unless I'm an FAA UAS, which stands for Unmanned Aerial System Remote Pilot Airman Certification. Now, to be honest with you, we didn't come up with all that jargon. We would have called them a pilot, drone pilot or something. These are terms straight out of the FAA manual. The FAA and the NCDOT government also will require that operator to have an operating permit, an operator permit. So just like we have to get a driver's license to drive in the state of North Carolina, anyone with the city who's going to operate that UAV, that UAS system, must be a remote pilot airman certification holder, as well as an NCDOT government operator permittee. Their tests that they have to take to show that they understand all of the federal regulations. Each mission 
will have a UAS team leader who is the pilot in command. We will also have a safety officer. Why do we have both? If one person is operating the controls, that person may not be able to, if you pardon the expression, operate the controls and visually watch what's happening at the same time. So we're going to have a safety officer that will ensure that everything is set up correctly, that while the mission is being accomplished, that everyone is safe, that we're not doing anything, that we don't have multiple eyes to make sure we're as safe as can be. There'll also be visual observers will be optional, and that will be based upon the actual activity. For example, if you're using the drone down at National Night Out, which is coming up, uh, Chief, August the 6th? I believe it's the 6th. Okay, let's say it's August the 6th. You're going to have eight to 10,000 people down there. We will need not only the team leader and the safety officer, but around the entire park, because the drone will be flying over a large distance, we will have visual observers so that they will be able to report back that whatever they see, so that the safety officer and the pilot will have more eyes than you would normally have uh, in a less crowded situation. We also have a list of prohibited missions, and we have a list of missions that can be approved. <clears throat> the list of prohibited missions and the list of missions that can be approved, reading that twice. We have specific language addressing the protection of civil rights and privacy, which the city attorney has given input on, and we have the rules of operation. Potential benefits, as we mentioned before, crash scenes. Land Treatment Forestry Surveys, Site Surveys, Fire and Rescue Operations, Public Facility Inspections, City Events and Insights. For example, a water tower. We have to do water tower inspections. Well, right now, we don't send city employees up there because some of them are certified, although before I retire, I hope y'all will give me permission to climb at least one water tower <laughs> and see the community from 135 feet. But, you can take a drone and it can look over the entire water tower. It can take, you know, remote, it can take live uh, pictures, it can take video, it can do infrared, it can do an inspection. Same thing if you're out at the uh, transmission lines. Let's say that we get a report that one of our uh, manholes out in the middle of nowhere is uh, overflowing and there's high water. Instead of trying to get a crew out there to see is that correct, just simply fly the drone down the path. When you get there, take pictures, remotely send them back. So those are the type of uses I think you can see that we would do. What we will do is uh, in the next day, we will forward to you the entire policy. It's about uh, 15 pages long. We would ask for you to review that. If there are any issues in that that you'd like to further discuss, let us know. If there are any issues in there that you think you cannot support, we would like for you to tell us that. Again, this is not a policy that you will adopt, but it is definitely a policy as the manager that I want you to have reviewed and feel comfortable with. John, questions or comments? Yes. Mike, would you come up, please? Sure. <clears throat> Why don't you sit over next to the city attorney? <laughs> that way it's oh, yeah, easy that for me. <clears throat> well, uh, any thoughts on the policy? Uh, you might describe how we put the policy together because it wasn't just my writing or John's writing. Well, I mean, we had a team of, of folks that put it together, looking at all the different, uh, different state laws and the federal laws, and also what the, what the requirements are. Because the requirements have changed dramatically over the last several years including what, how you can fly that and the licenses that are required and the training that's required to do that. So I think all those are good things and I think that, uh, that we worked diligently to make sure that we addressed every concern, including concerns that have to do with Fourth Amendment rights and privacy concerns and, uh, and the state law that, per that pertains to those privacy concerns as well. Ron, you helped. Do you want to add anything? No, it's a... Uh... You know, there's a lot of coordination required with this, especially with the airspace that the, that the air station controls and that. But Why I don't think you touch on that point a minute about the contacts we'll make with the base when we fly? Yeah, the, well, the base, uh, 
you know, of course, they control the airspace w within the, so many miles of the control tower from the surface to 2,000 feet. So you can't launch in that area without contacting the base first because you're operating in their airspace. And their so airspace that, is not over the base. It is well beyond their border. Yeah. It's a five-mile radius around the airfield. And then, so, but the, the, air, the, the base is, gonna, is willing to cooperate because the FAA rules on the drone limit how high they can go. And that really generally won't conflict with the, where the base aircraft are flying. But <clears throat> they want to know that there's drones operating in their control zone. And so there, there is a need for us to check with them to tell them we're going to launch. And how high, you, you talked about the, the fact that a drone can only fly so high. So how high is that? It's, it's actually less than 400 feet. Do they make do they make the uh, drone so that that's kind of a limit or do they yes they do they some depending on what drone certainly the one some of them that you know the inexpensive ones don't have some of the same kind of controls but they actually if they're inside a controlled airspace it, they they can't launch in some cases you know where there's there's communications with some of the drones that are out there that they can actually disable them and, I was curious, the <clears throat> certification and licenses, those requirements are imposed by whom? Well, they're imposed by the state of North Carolina for an operating permit and by the FAA. And they apply to the machine? They're, no, they, they apply to the, to the pilot. To the pilot. Oh, I'm just saying, is it the pilot of the machine? Right. I mean, obviously you don't have to get that for the Walmart stuff, but if you but, buy something like we have. Yes. Is that yeah. where it kicks in? Yeah, no. you'll have to have a you have to have a license, and and of course they're they're more sophisticated right. than, than some of the toys that are out there. But um, you'll have to have a license similar to a, a, a pilot's license. Some of the same kinds of things you'd have to learn in that in that process. So an yeah. individual could have it if they have got those. Yes. yes. In fact, uh, in fact, a couple of our our employees already have those license or are already working toward. Those license, whether it's a personal license or a commercial type license. Yeah, actually, from a personnel standpoint, uh, Kevin Rafael in media is getting his license. May have them. Yes. Uh, we also have uh, Chris Contreras, who is in IT and GIS because he's a surveyor. We have uh, one of your police officers, Officer Cressy, and then one of your firefighters. Yes, Mike Jordan. Okay, Fire so Marshal. those are the four right now. Now we're not limiting that. But uh, those, you know, we're already taking steps so that, uh, you know, once this policy is adopted, we'll begin the training program, and those will be the only four people who uh, have passed. Now, if two other people, three other people, six other people get their certifications, they will submit those to Mike, they'll submit them to John and to myself, and we will concur that they've received the necessary authorizations to use the to use the drone. <coughs> so there's even a training program for the observer too. Oh. It's it's a little bit uh, less, but we'll we'll have folks that will take that class as well to be the observer as well. So what we have is just got visual capabilities, or it's got like infrared as well. Infrared, yeah. recording, heat seeking, heat, and, and, do heat and recording capabilities. Recording. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One of the important things is the infrared, because let's say that uh, again, using the example of a, a person who. Uh, has dementia or Alzheimer's and they get lost in the woods. Uh, by using the infrared, you're going to see the body heat. You'll be able to, to track that person and possibly locate them. So pursuit. Pursuit. Well, yeah. you, you can use it for pursuit and you can use it on, on uh, search warrants. And there are some requirements if they do get a search warrant. Those that, that has to be listed on the warrant itself. So it's a little bit different than... So they're, they're well, you have to use list the drone right, search warrant. That you're going to use that drone as, as part of the as part of that search warrant. So, Mike, talk about what the state you know, state and the accident investigation and the reconstruct. Yeah, so the the state's using those right now to do. Typically, what we do is we go out and we do a. Um, the officer goes out and puts these cones out that that's done with a laser in order to get the measurements. Well, some of the software now is doing it from the air. So in, in the time it takes us maybe an hour to do a, uh, an accident scene, it'll take us roughly 10 to 15 minutes. Once we get the drone up 
they're able to do the measurements uh, based upon based upon the software and give us all that information <coughs> at the scene of the crash that probably took us two to three hours where we had to make close Western Boulevard or or 17 on a major crash it'll it'll cut down that time tremendously for us once we get the software and the uh, and the training for the officers to use that Carmen would you mention for a moment because she was part of the team also the public records retention well <laughs> Public records retention, it depends on the type of video that's being taken. So it's about content, not ex not necessarily about just because it's drone footage. Um, so for the police, video footage would be 30 days, like unless it needs unless to be used. used. For, yeah. So it's, it would be various uh, retention periods. But it does fall under our public records policy and under the guidelines of, yes. the, of the state. Here we go. Mayor and Council, one other item that we would like to spend a minute on uh, advisory, thank you, Mike, advisory committee attendance. <coughs> In 2012, we, re we substantially uh, altered the number of advisory committees and we established standards that were placed in the city code. Those standards had everything to do from being a registered voter and a resident of the city to attendance. Several council members have asked about the issue of attendance. What we have found is uh, that we do have a number of people who've had attendance issues. Uh, the current code says that if a member misses three consecutive meetings, they're automatically, it takes no requirement on your part, they're just automatically removed. If they miss three out of five, they're automatically removed. What it also says, though, is that anybody who's removed can also ask to be reappointed. So many of the people who've been removed have been reappointed. Because of that, uh, several council members have said, is this really the best thing for us to be doing? Because people do miss. If they're automatically removed and we reappoint them, what is really being accomplished? So tonight we'd like to get some guidance from you because if we're going to change, the city code has to change. And if you agree with some of the thoughts this evening or give us better direction this evening, then we'll be prepared on August the 7th to actually have code amendments. Here are some simple, uh, you know, in the past we've had six to seven members removed. Everyone who's asked to be reappointed has been reappointed. So. Uh, no, many committees meet less frequently than in 2012. What does that mean? Every committee used to meet every month. We now have committees that are meeting once a quarter. We have committees that are meeting once every uh, two months. Uh, the Water and Sewer Advisory Committee enjoys Mr. Thomas's uh, uh, presence so much they that they really want to meet, you know, three or four times a month if they could. <laughs> but there have been sessions where we've not had a quorum. So attendance is an important factor. The options are simple, no change. Leave it if you miss three, you're automatically removed. If you miss three of five, you're automatically removed. Option one. Option two, enlarge the number of absences you can have. Instead of three, make it four consecutive meetings. Instead of three out of five, make it four out of six. Option three is simply remove the attendance requirement. Reduce all appointments to two years. Have no caps on the number of years you can serve. We will record attendance and at the time, and we will also note were there any quorum issues for that committee. And at the time of reappointment, we simply make that part of the report back to you that says <coughs> this person uh, out of a two year period had, pick a number, had 12 potential meetings, he attended 10. So he had two absences. There were no quorum issues. You can then decide as the mayor and council, do you want to reappoint him or not? Or let's use the same example. There were 12 meetings. The person missed eight of them. Three times there was a quorum issue. So you use that information to decide do you want to reappoint him or not. You know, what we would recommend uh, as a staff, and Carmen, the, the heavy lifting on this really falls to her because 
She's the one who has to make sure all the attendance is kept, and she's the one who has to send out the uh, polite letters saying, we're sorry, but you're no longer there. And then it requires, when somebody wants to be reappointed, uh, getting it on an agenda and so forth. We would actually recommend this one. We think the advisory groups, now that we have cut them down to a reasonable size of advisory board uh, or committees, that uh, we have pretty good attendance. We have had some people who have had attendance issues. Uh, sometimes it's because of illness. Sometimes it's because I was trying to fly back from a meeting and the flight got canceled. I plan on coming to the meeting that night, but I wasn't in town. It takes away any of the issues about excuses or problems. It just leaves it in your hands at reappointment time. Now let's talk a second about the two years. Anybody who is currently serving more than two years, they continue to serve. But let's say for discussion purposes that uh, in August you have somebody who's up for reappointment on one of the boards. They would be reappointed for a two year period. That way, you know, whenever the time is. I'm just making this stuff up, folks, so you gotta help me out. <laughs> You're doing right. but you, see, you see the example that I'm, I'm giving. So this is the simplest, cleanest, and of course it falls back to you at the time of reappointment based upon that person's attendance, and that's not the only thing. There are other criteria for being appointed or reappointed. Number one would be attendance. Number two, the value that you as a liaison feel that person contributes. Because if that person just sits there and never speaks, but attends and enjoys a slice of pizza, do they really need to stay on the committee or not? And then, of course, uh, some of the other things, uh, you know, do they, you know, how much do they participate? And are they a positive influence in the advisory committee when they are participating? I'm not being negative, but I will say, uh, most of our members are very positive in their contributions. We have a few who really aren't. I won't mention any names of which committee, but those are factors that you will then determine when it comes to reappointment. So what we're to ask tonight uh, is, do you have any thoughts about option four or what do you want to do? I mean, I'd like to say, you talked about the water sewer, which we, when I first came on the council, it was every other month, or I forget how many times a year. But what we ran into at that time was there was so much activity, growth going on, that by the time you got there, you really didn't have a chance to input because things were moving right. so fast. So we came to the monthly meeting. We have a monthly meeting. Now, something did happen in 12. I don't know. I remember when it changed. It seemed like we lost a little um, as far as interest in being members. Maybe I misperceive that, but that seems to me we haven't had as many applications. I'm carrying two vacancies on the water sewer. My concern about reducing the attendance is the quorum. You know, if people are not in, inclined or, you know, pushed a little bit to make it an attendance, then what happens is you come up, okay, three people didn't show up, you don't have a quorum, well, they didn't miss a meeting. So there you kind of a double-edged sword. So they didn't show, but they didn't get a missed attendance. So it makes it harder to achieve quorum. Um, I'm about ready to talk to my group about less frequent meetings because we often have canceled in advance for lack of agenda items. So, um, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm always willing to listen to what you got, but this this concerns me. If there's no requirement, then you might just have somebody, you got to wait them out two years. And, you know, if you get two people, it could mean that there's one that's going to, you know, you'll be out of business. If you don't have a quorum, you just show up and then, you know, can't do any business. I don't know. There's is there one way, is there some way to tag the person who doesn't? show up that does break the quorum, the quorum requirement. Uh, say like for instance, well I guess that would be kind of difficult to do. Yeah, yeah, it's just, it could know, be various people at different times. It doesn't have to be one individual. And, and I don't have anybody in particular on my committee that I think of that's got low attendance, but it's just, if everybody said, well, I'm not gonna get penalized anyway if I don't show up, then maybe that night's 
the wife cooks something great, you don't want to miss it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, that may solve your problem, but it's to kind of space out your meetings. It may, but then again, you you know you it makes it even more important to have a quorum. Exactly. You know, if you got every you know like scheduled every two months. Well, you know, one of the uh, there is no best practice. I mean, I can tell you, looking at others, uh, some people say attendance, we just don't take it. Other people have attendance requirements. So it's not like we can do what I'll call a, a industry search and come back with the best practice. It's really, these are advisors to you, and we're simply reporting because you're the ones who, who hear when somebody gets the letter that they've been removed, uh, you know, they will call back and They'll say, well, the reason why I missed that third meeting was because my flight was canceled or I was in the hospital. Uh, there's no such thing as an excused absence. Right, not anymore. And we, we purposely took excused absences out because how do you say to a person that has the flu that they're not excused, but a person who was in the hospital with an appendicitis was excused? We don't want people with the flu coming in either. You know? <laughs> so, that's true. And you don't have to deal with this this evening, but there comes a point where you know you need to tell us uh, stay with the code or here are some suggested changes. I'd like I liked option three only only because I think the letter has caused some hard feelings among some folks, some, some good folks. Uh, you know, most most of the people that are on the committees want to be there, and I, I think um, sometimes there are some extenuating circumstances. And I think that, that we just potentially upset people, good people, for for some. From and I'm, I'm I'm agreeing with Randy that a quorum is important because I've been on the planning board, part of the planning board for 20 some years now, between member and liaison, and we've had some meetings where we didn't have a quorum. And that's that's frustrating for everybody, especially to those who show up and. How they got to go back home? You know, well, especially maybe, when we've advertised yeah, a public hearing, yeah, public and hearing or something. Yeah. Hearing. So, but but I think I, I'd like to try this. I'd like to try option three just to see. You know, we're talking about a two-year trial, but I don't think it's going to make a major difference one way or the other. Uh, I think those who are interested in serving and, and attending will continue to do so, and, and and we'll get a chance to if you record attendance, and even if there's no quorum, still you're. You're marking down who showed up because it was a called meeting and who was, you know, obviously who was not, who missed it. And and it gives us an opportunity to talk to that individual. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'd almost like a letter to go out to to the uh, to somebody that, that when they, when their time comes for reappointment, rather than you just notifying us that hey, so and so is up for reappointment. Do you want to do so? How do you support them? Maybe a letter to that individual. Hey, your um, your appointment is up. You attended blah blah blah. If you wish to be reappointed, please contact your liaison so and so, and copy us. And this gives us an opportunity to, to review it. And then if they call, maybe ask some questions or, or how, how committed are you? You know, I don't always remember uh, who showed up or who didn't show up. You know, not not when you have a, a large group. I, but obviously, uh, I do know who who's who's active, who's who's participating, who's in, you know, who's obviously up on whatever we're doing. So, you know, just a suggestion. But I, I like option three. I like I like uh, I agree with what you're saying there. Let me give you one other thought that we can do. You know, you're the liaisons. You attend these meetings. <clears throat> what we could also do when we begin to see an attendance issue with someone. We could simply send you an email that says, uh, you know, Mr. Warden, this member of the PAB has yes. uh, now missed uh, three meetings, mm -hmm. two meetings, six meetings, whatever. Yeah. And that gives you the opportunity to call that person up and say, is there an issue here? Yeah. What? You know, we need you to attend. Yeah. Is there an issue here? Yeah. We, could give, we could communicate better with you all, and then you, as the liaison, can contact them. Again... There's nothing like the personal touch, I don't think. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a yeah. better way to I think that's, that's, uh, that's a good way. And I think it's a more positive way to reinforce rather than a letter saying, hey, uh, sorry, we're kicking you off the committee. You know, I think this has made some made some uh, some hard feelings uh, where we don't need to be. I'm fine anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, like I said, I 
like I said, it just. I don't. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm, yeah, our, I our current requirements, in my mind, are not onerous. They're not. They're no, not I mean, tough. three or five. You know, if you're if you're start. interested in, if you're interested in doing this, then right. you should be there. As but I but you are going to have some. But that's some the, the ability to reappoint yeah. negates all that anyway. I know. So it's, I know. you're not really. Well, but if if we ask them, if we if we're kind of in touch with their tenants, and then they they've got to come to maybe come to us to ask us for reappointment. I like that idea better than us just saying, oh, you know, maybe we will just reappoint the guy, you know, or a girl, whoever. Hey, as you said, the personal touch is is important. I agree with it. All right, we will work then on some code uh, amendments for August the seventh. Thank you very now, much. Now, will they, will part of that be they will come to us personally or will they still go through Sammy? Like writing a letter wanting their reappointment instead of addressing mm -hmm. us, they would address Mayor Phillips. I'd, I'd rather them address the liaison. Yeah, absolutely. Personally. Okay. You know, we're the ones who are going to be recommending to the rest of the board, hey, I know they've had this individual may have had some attendance problems, but I still recommend. I okay. That's just Anybody, you, you know, it could be your responsibility when you have a situation like that to maybe, you know, um, let the person know that obviously there's some conflict yeah. with their schedule with our schedule yeah. that, you know, you know, we might have to look at putting someone who can attend the meetings. The, you know, the, the letter, I know, uh, like, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to use any names, but I know an individual that after they got the letter said, you know, maybe they're right. Maybe I do have, maybe I am too busy to continue to participate. But I'd rather do that in a, in a little more positive manner than, than, the, than the, sorry, than the Dear John letter. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate the direction. It's like to say, I'd like to see them leave with a good taste in their mouth. If they Certainly. Have they, they, they yeah. volunteer. They're, they're doing this on their own time, and, and I think we, we need to encourage that. So. Well, we appreciate the direction. Those are all the items that we have. You have a city council meeting in 10 minutes. Motion to adjourn. Opposed. Opposed. <laughs>